Amen. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, God had his hand in the little meeting that I had. We were um, we were on uh, a, it was a British Virgin Island. I can't remember the name of it. And, um, you know, we did our shopping, and then now we don't know what to do. So Lisa said, are they doing tours of the island? Well, the, the ship already had these, they were open-air buses, what they were. And uh, so we were standing there, and there was a t taxi driver that wasn't associated with the ship. And he said, do you folks need help? And I said, you know what, we might. So, you know, I might be coming back to you. So we went over where everybody from the ship was getting on buses. And they pointed to a bus. Now, this bus had everybody on it that could get on it. And they said, oh, no, you got room. You can, they got, everybody was squeezed together, you got room. And I'm like, I don't want to squeeze. I don't feel like being squeezed today. So I said, forget this. I'm not doing it. And so we ended up walking back over where that taxi driver was. And um, his name, get the, his name is Lord Byron. That's his name. It's his first name, Lord Byron. And um, so anyway, I asked him, I said, uh, do you do island tours? He said, I sure do. And I said, okay. I said, uh, where's your cab? And he pointed, he's got a minivan, real nice. And so we all got in it and he's taking us around the island. And uh, he stopped. Lisa said she wanted a mango, and he stopped. There was a mango tree, and he was pulling mangoes off and said, here's your here's mango. And then there was these little bitty, looked like cherry tomatoes, but they were green. And uh, it's a type of grape. They call it a grape of some kind. And you just peel the hide off of it and eat it. Like, it tastes good. And he found a tree, and he pulled some of those down, was giving them to us and everything like that. And he said, how do you like that? I said, I like it a lot. I said, I doubt that we'd be able to grow it in Missouri, but I like it. And I said, we have persimmon trees. He said, I buy persimmons from the supermarket here. I said, really? And I told him, I said, you know, they don't go ripe in our neck of the woods until after the first frost. And I said, if you want to eat, if you ever eat one before that, you'll know it. You'll never do it again. Because, man, you'll pucker up like that. And I said, we've got a persimmon tree right behind our church few miles down the road, he said, did you say you were a pastor? And I said, no, I didn't say that, but I am. He said, so am I. I'm like, really? So he says, what denomination? I said, Bautista, Baptist. And he said, we're Baptist. He said, we used to be Southern Baptist, but we left them. And he said, now I think it's General Baptist. General Baptist, Freel Baptist, very identical. They swap preachers all the time. And I said, well, how about that? And so we just talked. You know, he, try, he was still trying to do his tour, you know, showing us this and that and what it was and on. But he's, he's talking about how corrupt everything is. I said, it is. And I, I pulled up my phone and I pulled up one of my videos and I said, that's me. And I said, I talk about stuff like this every week. And uh, so at the end, he, we traded information. I've got his name and email address. He's got my email address and all that. And uh, it was just, I could tell it was something that God had put us together for that little cab ride. And uh, so I rejoiced in that. That was a blessing to me. And uh, so you pray for this man, Lord Byron. I can't remember. He's got three more names after that. And, um, but he was referred to as Lord Byron. All right. So anyway, that we, had, we had fun, we had a good time, and uh, glad to be back, and I'll never fly American Airlines ever again. A uh, eight-hour trip turned into a 17-hour trip. They are, we should have known better. They are notorious for being late. They're notorious for having planes break down at the worst time possible. And that's what happened. We, were, we had it scheduled so that we left Miami plenty of time after we got off the boat. And uh, that plane was delayed two hours. So instead of leaving at 12.30 from Miami, we left at 2.30 Eastern. Then we get to uh, Charlotte, 
which is their hub, and um, we were supposed to leave at 6.30, and when we got to the Charlotte airport, we had to run a mile to get to our gate, so we get on the plane before 6.30, then we find out when we get there, the plane's not leaving until 9.30. So we sat down, I went and got a coffee from Starbucks, and I'm sitting there, and we're just, I'm reading and just kind of occupying my mind. I had a couple rocking chairs. We sitting in those. In the plane then, we noticed that they changed it from 9.30 to 10.30. Then they changed it to 11.15. And then as we were getting on the plane, they were telling us, hurry up and get on the plane and get in your seat. They had brought a new crew in of, of uh, stewards and flight guys. And they said... Uh, we've got only got so many hours that we can do this tonight and if you guys take too long we'll have to pull everybody off the plane and we'll have to cancel the flight because we can't work over a certain time yeah and so finally probably about quarter till 12 midnight is when we finally taxied out and got up in the air we got home at about 2 2 30 in in the morning um, uh, Monday morning so, needless to say, we didn't get up at 6.30 and come in to work. We got up at 10 and came to work. But it's good to be here tonight. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, and we'll get it in gear. And uh, how'd you like that young Lucas Waltheis? I think he uses more scripture than me. I think he does. So I'm a little bit jealous. But I like that. I think he's on the right path. And just pray for him as he grows and matures that the devil doesn't take him on the wrong path. Because that's what happened to me. And uh, I'm still paying for it to this day. So anyway. Uh, Acts chapter 1. We started on this uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we're going we're gonna to continue in it tonight because I, I think it's important. Um, this issue of the clouds and the clouds being the sign of Christ's return uh, is, is a very big major sign. It is huge. And the Bible is full of the details then of what is going to happen when Christ appears in the clouds. So in verse 9, uh, when he had spoken these words, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Think about that. And, and the opposite of that is the other Jesus. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And here we have a, we have a detail of opposites. If you think of opposites, whenever you're hearing something about Christ, the opposite of that would be what the Antichrist is. So Christ ascended up into heaven. There he is at the right hand of the Father. He's opening the book. And, um, and then he's going to come down to meet us in the clouds, in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Antichrist has gone down into the pit. That's where he is. When it's time, he's going to rise up from his prison, from his pit that he's in. He's going to rise up from that. Uh, John said that he came up out of the sea. And so he's, we, the Bible refers to the sea as the deep. You know, the, uh, the demons, the devils, they besought Jesus not to cast them into the pit, but, uh, you know, do something else. So Jesus cast them into this herd of swine. The herd of swine ended up going over a cliff and going down into the deep. It's like Jesus is going, wink, wink. You should have asked something different. But anyway, uh, so the Antichrist is going to rise up out of the sea. Uh, and uh, everybody that is on the earth is going to follow him. They're going to do it voluntarily. They are going to do it voluntarily. People who don't believe in God now are going to believe in this God. 
They're going to follow him. They're going to worship him. They're going to receive his mark. Uh, they're going to fight for him. And uh, what a day that's going to be. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together in your house tonight. And Father, all of our, all of our friends here at Bethel and all of our friends and brothers and sisters that are watching online. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd bless them in a great way. And uh, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would open up our eyes tonight. Help us to see wondrous things out of your law. Help us, dear God, to, to receive light and instruction and understanding. And Father, even though we can't see into the future, all we can do is, is read your word and try to get an idea of what that might be like and just trust you that you're going to do what you're going to do exactly according to what the book says. In fact, Jesus, you said that, that in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. We know, Jesus, that you're going to follow this book and its prophecies. And even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I know that your people are tired. We're living in a world that is becoming ever more corrupt, uh, ever more dangerous to Bible-believing Christians. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with us, keep us, Father, as your own, and in due season, Lord, we pray, dear God, that you would receive us up into yourself, that where you are, we will be with you for eternity. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say to that, Amen. Amen. So, just running through this very quickly, this issue of the clouds. Remember what Jesus said, that they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And when he does that, he's going to send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So this idea of the clouds, when we see the clouds, whatever they're going to be, then we know that Jesus is going to be in those clouds, and that's when he's going to receive us up into himself. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus again is saying, and he's saying it to people that don't want to hear it. I guarantee you. Verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He is coming. When, when the clouds cover the land, the bow, Jesus, is going to be in that cloud. That is our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's out of the book of Colossians, I believe it is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then five things, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, listen to that. I mean, think about it. I mean, let's, let's say that, uh, I don't know, your favorite, your favorite Hollywood actor or your favorite politician or uh, somebody that uh, is famous and you follow them and you think it would be neat to meet them and finally you get to meet them. You get to shake hands with them. You get to talk to them face to face. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty neat thing if you've ever had the opportunity to do that. And uh, of course I wouldn't do it with Joe Biden. No, I wouldn't expect much of an answer anyway. Especially when I tell him I'm voting for the other guy, by the way. But anyway, we're going to get to meet Jesus. I mean, we've worshipped him all this time. We have believed in him against the judgment of our family and friends who told us, oh, don't get involved in that stuff, that's religion, you don't need that. We've believed in him. We've given our life to him. He's given his life for us. He abides in our hearts. He lives with us. And yet he's on the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for us. He is, uh, he is the one who carries our prayers like the high priest. He carries our prayers to the Father and the Father answers those prayers. So we're going to get to meet him face to face. That's what Paul said. For now we see through a glass darkly and then face to face. I would love that. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. 
So shall we. Have, yeah, I had a dream the, the other night. Don't, don't psychoanalyze me. But I had a dream that I could fly. I had, a, had the flying dream. Who's ever had a flying dream? Okay, good. I'm not, I'm not alone. But I could. I could just jump and through my own mind power, I could make myself move through the air. And I thought it was the neatest thing in the world. Well, I can't fly. But one of these days, the world is going to see us standing in the air on nothing. And we're meeting Jesus there. Comfort one another with these words. Amen. We're going to together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 1, behold, he cometh with clouds. Very important, very, very important. And every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. So he's coming in the clouds. Revelation 10, we have the angel clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was upon his head. Genesis 9. Genesis 9, because that is what it points right to. Genesis 9 and that promise that when we, see, we saw a, a rainbow uh, on the ship, we got, we got rained on one day, and it was rained. We were on the northern side of that hurricane, and we got some of that rain. And uh, st storms out at sea, if you're not used to it, you can, you can always feel that boat rock. And it, as it, if it's moving, then you feel it like that, and then it turns and it goes like that for a while. And then it sways again like that. I don't know. I guess that's the water currents doing that and the waves causing that. But it's just a, they tell you when you go up downstairs and stuff, hold on to the rail. Because it, it could rock you a little bit. Some people just don't get used to that and have to take medicine so they don't get seasick or anything like that. But anyway, um, Genesis 9, 11, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. That, listen, uh, if you look in Revelation 12, I was thinking about this the other day. We have two great wonders. One is the woman, and she's great with child. And the child is Jesus. Um, because he's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. What do you think that rod of iron symbolizes? What do you think it does? Huh? The law in what way? What does iron signify? If you got, huh? Strength and you can't bend iron. Okay, especially if it's thick enough. You can't bend iron. You cannot bend God's law. Christ is going to rule and the law of Moses is going to be the basis of how things are done here on this earth. And I believe that we will be judges of this earth. Ten thousands of his saints, uh, which means there's more than ten thousand of them. And we will be judges and rulers of over areas in this world, uh, I have put my bid in for Alaska. So, uh, I've been there once and I'll go back. But anyway, um, we're going to rule and reign and we will rule by iron. Meaning that we won't be afraid of the faces of men. And since we have perfected bodies, then we can't be drawn away by our lusts. You can't bribe us because we're we own the cattle on a thousand hills. We're joint heirs with Jesus. What is it that you can give me? If you offer me gold, I'll just look at it and say, oh, pavement. Amen. And because it means nothing to us and we will judge perfectly and righteously. And we won't bend the law for anybody. No matter what their status is, no matter what they think about themselves. And that is done a lot around the world. There's corruption everywhere. 
And if you are a very powerful person or you come from a powerful family, then the laws of this country get bent or ignored for you. That happens a lot. Amen. All right. Anyway, back to uh, back to um, Genesis. Uh, verse 12. This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the what I was getting at in Revelation 12. I remember now is that uh, the serpent in verse 15 cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. So he tries to flood the earth, but he can't. It's not going to work. It's not going to be successful. The earth is going to help the woman and the earth is going to swallow up the flood that he releases out of his mouth. Think about I mean, there's so neat stuff in here. Uh, verse 13, I, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I, when I bring a cloud over the earth. That the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you. And every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now does that mean there's never going to be a flood? No, obviously not. But he's not going to destroy all flesh. And cover the entire earth with water. Like he did in the days of Noah. So what is then... This flood that's going, that the devil and his devils are going to release in those days. What is that flood? That's the, that's the question tonight. Uh, Psalm 69, 1, I have up there, what will take them away? Uh, meaning the, the uh, people that are on the earth that are not saved. Save me, O God, for the waters are coming to my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Psalm 69, 14, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not that water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. God is going to do that for those who call on his name. It's a promise. It's guaranteed God's going to do that. In Psalm 69, same chapter, verse 25. Let their habitation be desolate. Let none dwell in their tents, for they persecute him. Uh, let, let me just say this. What happens when a place where people live, all of a sudden the people don't live there anymore? What happens to that area? Huh? Huh? You're going to have flora and fauna. Plants and animals are going to move in, take over, destroy what's there. Um, and what happens in a situation like that? What moves in there? Dragons, owls, satyrs, those things that the Bible talks about. Um, that's what's going to move in. When their habitation is desolate and nobody dwells there. Uh, verse 27, and iniquity, they add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So that's what the flood represents, ungodly people. Second Samuel 22, 5, when the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men Made me afraid. Uh, uh, think about what, think about what's going on in our world right now. We got a war involving Israel and uh, Hamas, the Palestinians. We have that war going on. We have the war going on between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, that's messed up. And then we have a president who is incapable of leading this country. And why they keep propping him up? I know why they're doing it. Uh, they've got a foundation just like the Clintons have. They've got the, the Biden Foundation. It's supposed to be a charitable organization where they get money put in and they're supposed to use that to help people around the world. Well, the Clintons 
never helped anybody with their foundation. And there was two forensic um, accountants that looked at the Clintons' public records and said, it's like this Clinton Foundation is like their own personal little piggy bank. When she was Secretary of State, she went around the world offering, offering a special status to whatever nation she was in and that the United States will recognize you, the United States will be your friend. She was selling favors to these countries if they donated money to the Clinton Foundation. That's how the Clintons got all their money. And they just, they spent all of that money almost as fast as it came in. They were using it on themselves, which is a crime. If I were to do something like that, I'd probably go to prison for that. But that's what they're doing. And the Bidens are doing the same thing. That is why Jill and Hunter Biden are still there. But that's why they're in the White House. They're in charge. They're controlling what goes on there. To in, and that's why they don't want to get out of the race. They want a second term so they can load their coffers up with all this money that they're getting. Because they are selling us out for their own favors. Wow, where did all that come from? But look at, look at that verse, when waves of death come past me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. I am afraid for our country right now. We have an ungodly man who is, who is on the verge of senility. And everybody knows, we knew it back when he ran for president. We knew it. I don't know if YouTube's going to kick me off for this or not, but it makes us afraid. And in, in these days that we're referring to, there is going to be such a flood of ungodly men. And that, I believe, is the flood. And what did God say when, let me go back to this, when I bring the cloud over the land, the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I'll remember my covenant, and I will not let them get away with this. Amen to that. Job chapter 20. Knowest thou not this of old since man was placed upon the earth that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. They which have seen him shall say where is he. And that, that puts me in mind. That verse right there Verse 6, though His Excellency mount up to the heavens and His head reach under the clouds. That reminds me of Isaiah chapter 14 and what Lucifer said. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The sides of the north is the north represents the heavens. And, uh, and he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And so God is saying, though you do that, and you try that, uh, you're going to perish forever like, like your own dung. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? And I don't know, I, I think this fits in here somehow, some way. But Elon Musk decided that the capsule that he built that goes to the International Space Station is called what? Does anybody know? The Dragon. He's got a dragon on the earth. He named it the dragon. He, and this dragon goes up. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will, um, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that's what Elon Musk is doing. And I look at that symbolism and I'm going, that's inspired. He didn't get that by himself. That thought or those thoughts were planted in his mind by probably, maybe the devil himself. I don't know, but that's just my guess. Isaiah 28, 2, behold the Lord, watch this. The Lord hath a mighty and a strong one. And, he, and he's talking about, I believe, the Antichrist. Which as a tempest of hail, that's, that's uh, Revelation chapter 8. And the, um, I think it's the first trumpet. 
which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing. And what did we say that was the flood of waters was? It was the flood of ungodly men. As a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. And I, I like this because it said the Lord has a mighty and a strong one. Meaning that God is even in charge of the devil, all of his devils, and the Antichrist. God's in charge of them. They're not going to do anything that God don't want them to do. So you say, well, why, why, would God, why would God control this Antichrist and cause him to do all of these things that he's going to do? Uh, where is our victory? Well, if you read um, like Deuteronomy 13, uh, God says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dream uh, gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass, and he says... Let us go after other gods whom our fathers knew not. Uh, you don't listen to that prophet. I have not sent him. I've, but I've, I've allowed him. Or I'm not going to say I'm, I've not sent him. God basically says, I sent him to prove you where your heart is. If you choose to go after this dreamer of dreams, this prophet, and then he says... We're going we're gonna to pray to other gods, plural. God says, I'm using that to prove who's on my side and who isn't. Because the people who see that for what it is, and they say, I'm not bowing to your gods. I'm not worshiping your gods. I have a God. And my God is more powerful than all your gods put together. My God is going to beat up your gods. You just wait until I tell on you. Amen. And uh, so God says, I'm using that to prove you. It's a test to see whether you're going to follow the word of God or you're going to go after these other gods. And this is a conversation that Lord Byron and I had in that cab was we both believed that devils have gotten into churches all over the world, all through America, and brought in corruption, and I believe it's going to be a it's going to be a simple thing, one day, because of how all of these churches are being misled. It's going to be a simple thing when somebody stands up and says, "We have angels now that are attending to us. Let's follow after them. Those are gods, and God's going to send them to prove who's on His side and who's not. He already knows that." But that's how he's going to do it. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? I like that song. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy, look at this, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. There it is. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Psalm 32. Mm -mm -mm. I love Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is the gospel in the Old Testament. It is. If you ever wanted to find the gospel in the Old Testament, Psalm 32 is one of the places you'll find it in. Because it basically, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer sea law. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That's gospel right there. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. God's going to protect us. From them and we will not be defiled by them. We will not be uh, tempted to follow after them. God is, going to, God is going to be our shield and our bulwark against that flood of great waters. That flood of ungodly men and devils. Turn to Amos 9. 
Oh, look at this. I believe, and here we are. I'm going to start talking Star Trek here. I believe that man in the coming years is going to be able to go way beyond the uh, gravity of this earth. And it's actually two places side by side in your Bible. If you have Amos 9 on one page, which I do, I have Obadiah 1 on the next page. And I can look at both of them. If you look at, let's start in verse 1 of Amos chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, Smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. And he that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Verse 2. Though they dig into hell. Thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven. Thence will I bring them down. And when you look at Obadiah. You see the same thing. Obadiah verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars. Tranquility base here, the eagle is landed. And they made the Apollo 11 patch before they ever went to the moon. And it features an eagle with a twig in his hand, landing on the moon and he's going to use that to build his nest and i looked at that and i'm like that's obadiah that is exactly what obadiah said though thou exalt thyself as the eagle though thou set thy nest among the stars and what happened they built a nest and it was the uh, lunar excursion module and a lot of people don't know this because uh the the events now when we see the events of apollo 11 they put it all together. They, you see them landing, and then you see them coming out of, of the uh, Apollo. And, um, but when they landed, they, it was time now for them to rest. And so, um, um, who, were, who was on it? Buzz Aldrin curled up on the floor, and Neil Armstrong made him a little hammock on there and slept in that. Now, they're... They only weigh one-sixth of their earthly weight. So it's probably the most comfortable sleep they've ever had in their life. Okay, And they slept for about five hours. And then they got up and they, they did their moonwalk and all of that stuff. You know, like this. I can't do it. But anyway, I won't do that again, I promise. They did their moonwalk and all that stuff. Talked to Richard Nixon. And uh, they didn't know that the phones was bugged. But anyway, uh, they talked to Richard Nixon. And then when they got done and went back on the Eagle, they, they slept again. And they had another sleeping time because they had to wait for um, the, the command module uh, with Mike Collins in it to come around enough so that when they left, they met him. And this, the math of this... How here is Mike Collins going around the moon at like, I don't know, 10,000 miles an hour. And the eagle takes off and comes up and meets them in this, at the exact spot they're supposed to meet. And I'm like, that's crazy. But anyway, um, I believe that there's coming a time when man is going to be able to go to very, very far places. And you, you look at like Elon Musk and um, the guy that owns Amazon. Huh? Yeah, Jeff Bezos. And um, even the guy that owns Virgin Airlines. They're all building things for man to live in space. Robert Bigelow is doing the same thing. And uh, I believe these people think something's coming and they want to escape it. And God is saying, I'm not going to let you. 
no matter how far you go, I'm going to bring you back down. Okay? I mean, that's what he says. Um, yeah, let's see here. Though, thou excellency, though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach under the clouds, yet he shall perish forever. In other words, it's not going to work. They're going to try to get off the earth and not get caught up in all these things, but God's going to bring them back down. So back in Amos, uh, look at verse 4. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that, that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up wholly like a flood... And shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven. Look at that. What was Babel about? Let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And that's, that's, that's what the ISS is. It is, we have built a city. There is a, there is a, the government, the governing powers the International Space Station, go beyond any of Earth's nations. There is a different way that the people who live on ISS, because they come from different countries, there is a different way that they govern themselves. They have, they have rules and regulations that they must follow in order to live up there. And um, it's not governed by the United States. It's not governed by Russia. It's governed by a different entity. And uh, there's even a guy who started an organization. What did he call it? Elysium, I think. But anyway, he is putting all of his money into this organization that is bound to build a habitation for people to live in, in the skies, in, in space, in the heavens. And they're serious about this. So I believe that something like that is going to take place. They shall rise up like a flood and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. And then, um, oh, I like this. Proverbs 25, 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Every time I look at that, I think of charismatics. They boast of their false gifts. They don't have the gifts of the Spirit like they think they do. They don't have the gift of tongues. They don't have the gift of healing. They don't have that. Um, they boast of their gifts, but their gifts are false. Uh, they, they've caught Benny Hinn. They've caught um, Kenneth Copeland. They've caught others, Robert Tilton and others of uh, doing fake miracles. And when anybody asks for the medical records or at least the condition of some of the people that got up on stage and had Benny Hinn blow on them or whatever, wave his coat in front of them and knock them down, and then they say they're healed, when they actually get looked into, those people are not healed and they die because they believe that they've been healed or they believe that it's a process and that if they go back to their doctor, well, then that shows God you don't have faith in him. So now they believe that they can't go to the doctor and they die. That is sad to me. But they boast of a false gift. I've, like I said, I went to a, this Assembly of God church and I went down in front and I heard everything except true biblical Unknown tongues. I heard rattling. I heard. Dee, 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 dee. I heard. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, I heard it all. And the Holy Ghost is going, Mike, you know this is fake. Yeah, it is. Uh, Isaiah 19, 1, the burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And you look in Isaiah 44. I have blotted out as a thick cloud. Oh, I like this. When God brings this cloud over, that's when he's going to blot out Israel's transgressions. Think about it. Because Israel being saved and our rapture are connected. 
So I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. Seeing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout! Look at that. That's part of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. That's what God's going to do when he brings the cloud over. He's going to blot out Israel's sins. Jeremiah 4, declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, blow ye the trumpet. There's the trumpet right there. In the land, cry together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north. And what is the north? It's the heavens. And a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Sheba's, one of Sheba's hundred names is the destroyer. And the Hindus worship him as the God who, before he can create, he must destroy What's in, the, what's in the way. And so he is Sheba the destroyer, but they believe it's, he's destroying for a good purpose so that he can build something better, is, is what they believe about Sheba. And by the way, Sheba is depicted in many uh, belief systems as being half female and half male. In other words, the Antichrist, the androgynous God, okay? That's, if you want to understand the spirit that is manifesting itself through the LGBTQ plus. I saw a t-shirt. And it had LGBTQ plus on it. And he had written on there, let Biden get out of office. Uh, LGB. Yeah. L, let's get, no, let's get Biden uh, out of LGBT, I can't remember what it was said now, let, LGB, let, let's get Biden out of office, um, huh, yeah, I can't remember, man, I can't, I'm surprised I can't remember that, but anyway, I thought it was funny. Bad, bad joke. All right. Uh, the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make the land desolate. And thy city shall be laid waste without inhabitant. Jeremiah 4, 13. He shall come up as clouds and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. Think about that. The whirlwind. I mean, that's what Ezekiel saw. Coming out of the north was a whirlwind. A vortex. Okay. Like a wormhole. Um gravitational or how can I say it um, gravitational energy like a vortex or like a whirlwind his horses are swifter than eagles woe unto us for we are spoiled Jerusalem O Jerusalem wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved how long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee again this cloud is coming over and it's it's going to do some things it's going to bring in the the kingdom of the Antichrist when we see those clouds, we know that our redemption draweth nigh. But also, God is going to deal with Israel, and he's going to forgive all of their sins. He's going to wash them clean and make them pure, just like we read earlier. Uh, let me, um, boy, let's see here. Where do I want to read? Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. Study this phrase, day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, day of the Lord. Uh, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Clouds, the day of clouds. When, those, when, God, when God brings the cloud over the land, then look in the cloud You'll see the bow, the redemption draweth nigh. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people. Here's who this cloud is. It's a great people and a strong people. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. 
Where is this people coming from? They're coming out of the north. Coming out of the heavens. And they're coming like a cloud to cover the land. Zephaniah 1.15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble. Study that one too, day of trouble. A day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So, the day of the Lord is going to be a day of where the clouds come over, whatever clouds those are, uh, the clouds of ungodly men, the clouds of the, the nation that's going to come out of the north, that cloud, the cloud where God is going to blot out Israel's transgressions and forgive all of their sins, is the cloud that we're going to see the bow in it because God is showing that he's keeping his promise. He's not going to let Satan flood this earth. Even though the great waters come out of his mouth, the earth is going to help the woman and drink up all that water and say, Ha! Devil! You can't do it! Um, and boy, I, I got something in my mind about why the earth opens her mouth. And notice that the earth is characterized as a her. Why does, why does the earth open her mouth to help out God's people? The remnant. Um, when the earth is corrupt, she's like a harlot. But remember, God saves harlots. He saved Rahab. Changed her. Um, Gomer. Gomer was a harlot. And um, Hosea married her. Thought he would change her. But she goes out harloting herself after getting married to him. Then she ends up in the slave market. He buys, he pays the price for her and buys her. And now things are different with her. Now she's redeemed, she's forgiven, and she's been changed. Now she is a beautiful woman. Whereas before she was just used and abused. And uh, you pray for people that are living like this. I was watching a video um, the other day, cops trying to arrest this gal because she was drunk behind the wheel, 19 years old. And she started to drive off with the cop in, you know, he was like leaning inside the door. She tried to drive off. Well, he protects himself. He opens the door and he shuts the car off and he grabs her and pulls her out. And she is just screaming bloody murder. She screamed obscenities at this cop. I mean, for an hour, they brought an ambulance to make sure she was okay, and she was still. And you know what she said? She was mad because, and she was accusing a cop of abusing her, but it was all on body cam, so you know he, he was just doing what he had to do. And she said this, she said, uh, I've had this happen to me all my life, men abusing me. And one of them was a cop. That was her childhood. She had been abused, probably raped, and used by men. 19 years old, and all this is coming out of her because she's drunk. And you just, you're, you know, you know the cops got to do their job. They got to, she's a danger to other people because she's drunk. Um, but your heart just melts for people. Sometimes they're the way they are because they've been forced into that against their will. I want to be able to tell people like that there's redemption for everybody. And there's a new life and a new start for people that have had that done to them. And that's the kind of people that Christ goes out looking for. That's the sheep that's gone astray. That he leaves the ninety and nine and goes and finds the one sheep. And brings it back. I, I prayed for that girl. I don't know who it is. I can't remember where it was. But I prayed for her. Amen.